uh, Mark uh, was giving us a portrayal of what happened um, uh, when Jesus uh, was preaching in Simon's house. There were actually a lot of people who were crowding at his house. They came to hear him preach. Some came with different motives. Came, some came with different ideas. But all in all, Jesus, what he was doing in the house, he was preaching. And as he was preaching, the house was fully packed. Uh, people could not navigate their way into the house. And four young men came with their friend. And their friend was paralyzed. Uh, he could not save himself. He could not bring himself over to Jesus. So they devised a plan. They put together a plan that maybe let's just tear the roof off. So they tore the roof off. They dropped him down at the feet of Jesus. And we saw Jesus demonstrating his authority to forgive sin. And Jesus pronounced to the young man, your sins are forgiven. And this was a controversial statement uh, in that time, in that place, because the scribes, as they were there to observe Jesus preaching, as they were there to observe Jesus in his ministry doing his thing, they became very critical because according to the Jews, only God has the power to forgive sin. And rightly so, only God has the power to forgive sin. So clearly these Jews had no understanding who they were dealing with. They started blaming Jesus of blasphemy. They, did, they were accusing God of blaspheming God because their understanding of the Messiah was very limited. They thought the man that they were dealing with was just a common rabbi, just like any other rabbi, but they were in the presence of the holy. So they failed to see that they, this God who was standing before them, he has the power to forgive sin. So we saw Jesus asking them, which is better? To say your sins are forgiven or to say, pick up the mat and walk. So to demonstrate to them that indeed they were standing in the presence of the holy. To demonstrate to them that indeed there is, he has the power and the authority to forgive sin. What does he do? He tells the young man, pick up your bed and walk. And the people marveled and they glorified God. So today in this passage, still in the Gospel of Mark chapter 2, we are looking at yet another conflict that is brewing in the horizon. Yet another conflict that is geared towards Jesus. Yet another opposition that is geared towards Jesus. In the Gospel according to Mark uh, from, verse, uh, from verse 13, Jesus calls Levi. He went about again besides the sea. Look at, look with me. Actually, let me ask you to stand as we read God's words. Let me ask us to stand. Those who are able to, if you have strength in your body to stand, may we do that. He went out again besides the sea and all the crowds was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphia, sitting at the text booth. And he said to me, to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors, sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. Verse 16. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, he said uh, to his disciples, they said, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are thankful for the reading of God's word this morning. We are thankful that we could sit at your table and consider your word. We are seeing yet again a conflict that is brewing in the daily ministry life of Jesus Christ. But Lord, as we observe your word, we pray this afternoon that may you speak to us, O God. Speak your word, O God. Speak your word to us this afternoon. Speak your truth and may you reveal it to us. May that truth conform us into the likeness and in the image of Christ. May this truth instruct us. May this truth correct us. May this truth sanctify us for your word. Indeed, O oh God, is truth. May the words of our mouth, O oh God, 
and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable before your sight, O Lord, our God and our strength and our Redeemer. Glorify yourself in this moment. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may take a seat. I overheard a conversation between a father and a troubled son. A son has made a series of bad choices in life, made bad friends. His life was a constant series of bad outcomes. This young man, in an attempt to impress his father, he told his father that he has started attending a church to try and shape up a bit. With much skepticism coming from the father, the father defaulted to a cultural notion that you cannot go to church, young man, before you can sort out your own life. He went out on this cultural exposition of man-centered gospel of works. The sum total of this father's admonition was that God helps those who help themselves. The world has this perception on Christianity that good behavior and the sum total of one's behavior is the determining factor in God's saving qualities. This father has believed a cultural understanding that a person must be religious to become accepted by God. He assumes that the young man must clean himself and get himself right before he could consider coming before God. This is a cultural notion that, that good and well-behaved people will receive the reward. And when they attend funerals, or maybe they do all kinds of philanthropic duties, they will get some heavenly brownie points. This humanistic assumption that bad people who do bad things will receive eternal punishment. Even sometimes, parents, we are guilty of moralizing scripture to get our kids to shape up rather than develop a gospel-centered and a biblical worldview of human behavior. We aim for behavior modification rather than the gospel-infused transformation. Yes, we have the responsibilities as parents to teach our kids that life consists of cost, cost and effect. To every behavior, there are consequences either good or bad. And failure to the young people to adhere to parental discipline, eventually you will re it will result in lawful punishment by the state. Parents do not punish, they discipline. But the state does not discipline, it punishes. However, the gospel helps us to understand the state of a hum human heart. A man-centered gospel of works sends a message that God only loved the religious upright and the well-mannered people. You know, the ones that are well put together, morally decorated. The assumption of the moral gospel comes face to face in our text this afternoon. That Jesus came to the badlands. That the Son of God came to the badlands. To save sinners who are incapable of saving themselves. The ones that are unable to behave themselves in a right standing with God. Our text this afternoon shows us that Jesus is not intimidated by the sinful cultures. As a result, we see a feather tension building up with the religious culture. We saw in our text last week, they struggled with his claims to forgive sin as it was actu actual and assertive of deity. We saw how in the previous passages, he healed on the Sabbath and the scribe got their knickers in the notch over the fact that he demonstrated the authority over foul spirits and his authority over the Sabbath. The tension that faces Jesus with the religious leader stems from their pre preconceived notion that the moral behavior ends them a right to stand before a holy God. This morning we see a conflict continuing as Jesus calls the worst of sinners and associates himself with the worst of sinners, furthermore fueling his conflict with the religious elite. Verse 13, observe with me. He went again besides the sea 
And all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphia, sitting at the text booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Previously, we saw how Jesus was preaching at Simon and them. And all of a sudden, there was this commotion. Four friends who airdropped their friend at the feet of Jesus. Jesus saw their faith, extreme measures that they were willing to go to bring their friend before him. And as a result, Jesus forgives this man's sins. The tension mounted as they called him blasphemous because they believed that only he was equating himself to God and Jesus was exposing their thoughts and still goes further to demonstrate his ability to forgive sin and added a bonus of a physical blessing of healing this man. He asked, why do you question in your hearts, which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sin. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up the bed and walk. They were all amazed and they glorified God. We never saw anything like this. This is the testimony coming from the people. They had never witnessed something like this in history. What we are seeing here this morning is a typical day in the life of Jesus with his disciples. They keep circling around this town of Capernaum. Now they're back at Simon and Andrew's house because his ministry was marked with unmistakable evidence of supremacy and authority over sickness, over devils and the crowds. They followed him wherever he went. Everywhere he went, they followed and they flocked him. Whenever the crowds will flock to him, he will default to a primary purpose of his ministry, which is preaching and teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus here by the seaside, preaching the kingdom and the forgiveness of sin. And from preaching, he passes by the text booth and he does the unthinkable. What does he do? Sin too calls the unlikely. And verse 14, and as he passes by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphia, sitting uh, at the text booth and he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. This may have been the first seemingly scandalous call that Jesus has ever done so far in the course of his ministry. He has called fishermen, a very notable career in the, in the life of the Jews. To be a fisherman, it was, it, it, it was a, it, it was an highly esteemed career because this was the kind of business that it was passed from generation to generation. It was a res respectable trade that is deemed as a family legacy, something that could be passed from father to son. We saw how Simon called, <coughs> how he called Simon. And Andrew, how he called the sons of Zebedee, how he called the sons of Zebedee, and they were sitting with their father on the boat, they were mending the net. You can see that this was a family business. But now this time around, he's calling a text collector. He's calling what you would call, the NLT actually calls them the scum of the earth. He does the unthinkable calls this man to come and join his ministry. The reason it's unthinkable is because in this culture, everybody hated tax collectors. We actually do now, but in a nice way. Tax collectors always borderlined on the contours of extortion. They borderlined, they were considered shady because of their ruthless tax practices. This man, Levi, was a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew, but he was working for the Roman government. Their practice involved exploiting Jews economically for their benefit for, of the pagan government. And as a result, they were socially detested. They added some dubious texts so they would have their own cut. They operated within the broken and exploitive system that preyed on the poor. 
the business of these tax collectors was lucrative and unsupervised. The Roman authority only cared about their fair share. Whatever shaped, whatever, whatever happened to the Jewish citizen, they didn't care. Failure to adhere to these dubious tax demands will re result in an intervention by the Roman soldiers who were also ruthless in their response to such incidents. So the poor Jews were exploited by their very own people who were working for the enemy. These Jews were considered sellout. These tax collectors who were Jewish by birth were considered sellout because they have prostituted their sense of loyalty for the sake of profit. This man was not loved by the, by the Jews. They were not welcome in the fellowship. They ended up forming their own elite club of tax collectors united by their love for extra cash. Their religious leaders in their own hypocrisy deemed tax collectors as the most vile sinners. They were wealthy yet isolated from the commonwealth of Israel. In all their sinful depravity, Jesus and the calls these socially detested men. Jesus calls Levi, son of Alphaeus, makes him a disciple. We can interestingly observe that the call of Levi into the ministry was an effectual call, just like that of Simon and Andrew, just like of James and John. Jesus actually summons, summons this man. And this man, what does he do? Does he begin to debate with Jesus? Does he ask Jesus for his, um, uh, 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 his tin number uh, to check if this man has been paying tax? No, he doesn't. What does he do? He immediately follows him. The other attitude that we can consider of only the religious leaders, but also of the disciples. These disciples who were fishermen, and there was a likelihood that the tax collector would set up a, a, a collection booth by the trade docks. You know, these guys, as they were fishing, the fishermen, what they would do is they would set up a booth. A booth was something just like this pulpit. They would set, out, set it up around the, the fishing docks. As the, the money was being exchanged, the tax man was watching, was watching in the horizon. He was watching in the peripheries to see the exchange of this money so that he can impose tax. They have suffered. These fishermen, uh, these disciples, I would imagine that they had suffered at the hands of Matthew or Levi in this particular instance. They had to serve alongside him, but God has called him to serve in the ministry with them. I can only imagine the disciples walking up to Jesus. You know, they say, you know, I, I know that you know the hearts of men. You know, you know what goes on in the hearts of men. But you may need to calibrate your, your senses, man, your, your ability to discern. You may need to recalibrate your discerning game because you know what you just did? You just called the scum of the earth to join this ministry, yeah? This is not a good look on you, Jesus. You know what you just did? You just started, you just, you just messed up with our enterprise right now by bringing the swindler into the ministry. We have been stacking our followers. It's not going to look good. It might be a turn off in your ministry. Jesus' ministry was marked with compassion for sinners and even controversial figures because Jesus is in the ministry and he's in the business of saving the unlikely. His ministry is bent towards saving those, those, those who seem so unsavable. Levi was the most unlikely person, but Jesus in his mercy and compassion calls him. Levi has a tangible testimony. He had to give up his former life of extortion and thievery to follow Jesus to even be miscategorized by the religious leaders of the day, Jesus calls the unlikely tax collector to follow him and he immediately does as the call of Jesus is irresistible. Jesus, when he calls us to himself, when you have been marked by grace, the call of Jesus for you 
is irresistible. And we saw it in the lives of the disciples as he was calling these fishermen to follow him. They immediately followed him. Now we are seeing it evidently in the life of this tax collector. Jesus calls him and the call of Jesus is irresistible. His choice to follow Jesus is actually a public declaration that he chose to follow Jesus over financial affluence and notoriety. He knew how the people felt about his line of work. He knew how polarizing his work is and how it has hurt a lot of people, especially those of low income. Despite all that hangs on him, Jesus calls and grants him a sense of dignity and worth. Jesus follows, uh, offers him forgiveness and enrolls him into the kingdom adventures. This is a need of every man to know that our sin, no matter how scandalous they might be, there is a redeemer who can clean us. There is a redeemer who can enlist us in his army. Money gained from extortion could not satisfy him. But once Jesus calls him, he's, he is drawn to Jesus who ultimately gives him lasting satisfaction. Levi was offered a better life with God, a life with greater purpose and meaning, no longer defined by his job. His past and his vocation no longer defines him. He receives from Jesus what money can't give. This encounter with Jesus gave us a man who later became Matthew, the evangelist, the man who detailed the life and the ministry of Jesus, who gave us the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew did not keep this transformative experience to himself. When Jesus called him out of the muddy clay of sin, he did not keep that to himself. Nope, he did not. Let's see what he did with this. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Matthew, after experiencing this forgiveness, he does not keep it to himself. He calls other despised scammers. His fellow scammers, he calls them. He's like, guys, come on over to my house. Come on over to the house. The scums of the earth with hope that they will have a similar encounter that he had with Jesus. What does he do? He throws an outreach party. Invite his former colleagues to his house. They were not the most sanitized people. Everyone knew who they were and what they were about. They may not be invited into the synagogue or the religious storefronts, but he invites them into his house with Jesus present. Remember what kind of friends we, we, we make in our circles and what the, what's the circle of his friends, the, the, the friends of Levi. He would not be those that are religiously upright. They would not be those people who are morally sanitized. It, it will comprise of extortionists, legal con artists, the guys who have been certified by the Roman government to go now go ahead and, and scam them or do whatever it needs, you need to do. The social outcast, the scum of the earth. These were the guys who were rolling on Matthew's circle. He is amped about his new experience, his newfound faith. Now he wants to introduce his friends to Jesus that they may experience forgiveness of sin. He wants his friends to meet the one who forgives the worst kind of sinners. He experienced such liberation from Jesus that he instinctively throws an outreach party. All that Jesus was said, all that Jesus had said to this man was, follow me. This was enough to give Levi a sense of ministry obligation to call others to come and follow the man who has forgiven their sins. The one who are despised and considered the social outcast. He wants them to come and have an encounter with Jesus. I don't know what manner of lifestyle did Jesus save you from. I don't know where Jesus saved you from. Whatever lifestyle that is, that is, but you have a fidacious duty to introduce the people that you were with to the saving 
grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are called to follow so we may beacon others to follow. A natural response for the one who received Jesus must be a need to go back and call the friends. Those who have been pulled from the merry clay of sin have a tendency to be aggressive in sharing their faith because they know where God has pulled them out of. They understand the depth of their sin, that it had been for God and God alone. They do not have the luxury of pragmatism. They do not care about the ridicule of the religious elites. They do not care about, about, the, the, about being too overly con or conscious. Like the story of a blind man who was healed by Jesus in the book of John chapter 9. The book of John chapter 9 gives us this picture. A man who was healed by Jesus. And the Jews, they did not believe that he had been blind. And that he had received his sight. Until what did they do? They went to his parents. The parents of this man who was healed by Jesus in the account of John chapter 9. Who had received his sight. And they asked them, is this your son? Who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered, you know, they said, we know that this is our son. We know him. He was born this way. Nobody can tell us otherwise. But how, how, how he now sees, we don't know. We have no clue. We have no idea. No, we, we, no, do we know who opened his eyes? Ask him. He's of age. He's a grown man. You shouldn't be asking us. He's a grown man. Go and ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews and that the Jews had already agreed with, with if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. They were afraid of excommunication in the synagogue. Therefore, the parents, they played it safe. He's of age. He's a grown man. He can speak for himself. And out of self-preservation and in a culture that is steeped in self-perception, they said to the grown, he's a grown man, ask him. So for, for the second time, they call the man and he, this man, he said to him, give glory to God. That's what the religious were saying. They were saying, no, don't give glory to Christ. Give glory to God. For we know, we know that this man is a sinner. They were saying Jesus is a sinner. He answered them, you know what? I don't know your business, guys. I don't know whether he's a sinner. I have no idea. But I have one day, an idea about one thing. This one thing I know. That I was blind. Now I can see. I don't know a lot about I don't know the laws. I can't exposit the laws. I don't know much about the things that you know. I can't even testify to this man's character. But one thing I know is that I was blind. But now I can see. What has God done for you, my brothers and sisters? If he saved you, what is that one thing that you can proclaim? The saving grace of Jesus Christ, even under much scrutiny and criticism. That you can say, I don't know much. I don't know systematic theology. I don't know biblical theology. I don't know all these fancy things. But one thing I know is that my heart was bleeding with sin. My heart was steeped in sin. My mind was in the clutches of sin. All I could think about was vile. All I could utter from my mouth was vileness. All I know is that the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached and it changed me. It transformed me. I used to have a dead heart. My heart was dead towards Christ. My head was, my heart was dead towards Christ. Now all I know is that all I think about is the mercy of God. All I think about is the goodness and the kindness and the mercy of God. All I know is that sin has been taken away. All I know is that I can run free. I'm no longer carrying the weight of my sin. I may not be able to exposit these things like other men can. All I know is that I was a sinner, but I came face to face with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I am free. That's what the gospel does to us. Sometimes we can't explain it. The only thing that we can explain is that we were the enemies of God. We were haters of God. We were at war with God. We were at enmity with God. But because of his mercy, he has saved us. And all that we have is the testimony of his saving grace.
These tax collectors were an, were an equivalent of thugs and mafias and gangsters who collected a protection tax from the people to provide some kind of protection. Have you seen it in the movies where the mafias, they say, you need to pay up your tax or otherwise we're just going to let the other guys ravage you. That's how these tax collectors were like. They were pretending to be protecting the citizens from the, from the Roman government. Oh, my brothers and sisters, that same grace that has saved you is the same grace that has saved the chiefest of sinners, Mr. Levi himself. Let us not forget the depth of God's grace. When the evangelistic team calls us to go out, let us be zealous for these things. Let us open our homes to host a few people and tell them about God's saving grace. If we have really appropriated the weight of our former state, we must be zealous for the gospel engagement and preaching. Like someone who once said, we need to be acquainted with the depth of our sin so that we become re-enchanted with the depth of God's saving grace. And we start going hard for the gospel in our own circles. Levi puts together the evangelistic party, uh, evangelistic party, and in, in that party he invites not the ones that are fully sanitized, but these wretched sinners who moved in the same circle with him. Surprisingly, the scribes and the Pharisees were there crushing the party. Do we still have it in nowadays where they say no? These uh, these are the gate crashes. In the 90s, when we were having a party, somebody comes and they are not invited. We say, this guy is crushing the party. I don't know if the language is still the same. But these men, they came to the party and they were not invited. They were not invited to the party. This leads us to another scene. The self-engrossed elite. The self-engrossed elite. And as the scribes and the Pharisees, they saw that this, uh, that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors said to his disciple, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? In the sin, the party is in full swing. Jesus is engaging with sinners, having conversation with them over a meal. The elites, they come through in the scene and they see him eating with sinners. And they asked his disciples, they don't even have the guts to go to Jesus and ask him, why are you eating with sinners? No, they, they gravitate towards the, the weak guys. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does he do that? They cannot wrap their mind around the reality that a rabbi in the presence of sinners eating with them at ease. They do not even understand as to why would Jesus condescend, stoop so low and eat and converse with his scumbags. The scribes and the Pharisees hated the tax collectors. These elites were what you would call the separatists. The word, the word Pharisee actually in its truest sense means that being separated from the common man. Why would this elite find it so problematic that Jesus is reclining and eating with the worst of sinners? What you need to observe about this culture was that eating with, with people, it was not just to fulfill a hunger uh, uh, pangs. It was actually an, an intimate fellowship. Such dinners, especially when you are reclining, especially when you are eating and it looks like this guy is kicking back and he's enjoying this piece of steak. This was a demonstration of an intimate fellowship. Such dinners would require a special invitation, a certain level of, of exclusivity for anyone to attend. So that means that Levi went out to the extent of inviting his friends. Secondly, the hypocrisy of the separatists was very clear. They crashed the party where they were not invited. With curiosity, God and the curiosity got the best of them. So they were okay to come to the sinner's house now they are not okay that the sinner or Jesus is eating with sinners. What we also observe is that Jesus was eating with them, socializing with them, engaging with them in gospel conversation. There was a purpose in his eating and engaging with them. It was, it, 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 it was, it was fit. It was not just to look cool. It was not just to blend with the culture. His eating with them was 
had a purpose. It was missional. It is a problem if you say that we want to be around sinners, but we fail to actively engage them with the gospel. It is clear preaching of the gospel that would bring people to the reality of God's saving grace. The gospel clearly proclaimed, not assumed, behavior. The pragmatist, they would say that preach the gospel and if you must, use words. But I say preach the gospel and if you, and you must use words. Preach the gospel and you must use words. Jesus was engaging with these sinners with the gospel. The posture of Jesus is to call people to himself and he alone has the power of eternal life. These separatists, they fail to see Jesus' beauty demonstrated at this evangelistic uh, 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 invitation because they were wrapped up in themselves. If we lose sight of the saving gospel for sinners, we will, we will burn in contempt for sinners rather than burn with desire to give them the saving gospel of Jesus. These separatists could have at least paid attention to what Jesus was saying to the people rather than make undue judgment and assume his motives. They didn't care that he was offering life to these people and identifying with them. Remember before the inauguration of public, of Jesus' public ministry, when he went through baptism, we, we established that Jesus was actually identifying with sinners in his baptism. Now we are actually seeing it now here in his ministry, identifying with sinners. As for the Pharisees, they did not even have a care to engage with Jesus, to understand his ministry ethos. Why did he, why, why did, why he did what he did? And what they did was they perceived in their minds, but they did not have the guts to oppose Jesus and his disciples. All they did, they went to the disciples. What, did, what does Jesus do? He hears them and he responds appropriately. This is where the tension begins to intensify. This is where the tension begins to intensify. Sin number five, the master physician. Verse 17. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. This response mirrors our state of sin. None of us we're well enough to bring ourselves before a holy God. In essence, Jesus is saying to these guys, well, if you are so well put together, then you do not need my gospel. If you do not need my help, you really don't need it. Those who are in the tip-top shape do not need a physician. I'm here because people need help. No one understands the state of sin like I do. No one had the power to deal with sin like I do. No one can heal the sin sickness like I can. As for you, maybe you think that you are untouched by sin. This response speaks to why God came in human flesh. Why God condescended to be amongst us. Jesus came to save sinners. This is almost like a proverb that it is not healthy, it's not the healthy that needs a doctor, but the sick. Jesus uses this analogy. He equates the problem of sin to a sickness, which it, which it is. A sickness, a sick person has no ability to aid themselves. They do not need help or inter all they need is an intervention of a physician. They cannot fix themselves. This should reorient our perception of sinners. What they call, uh, I think the motivational speakers, they call it a paradigm shift. Sinners cannot help but sin. That is their vocation. They need the one who has conquered sin to help them deal with sin and its trappings. We cannot fix ourselves. These scribes had, had an overestimated perception of themselves. They thought that they were good enough on their own and that they did not need the help of a physician. And Jesus breaks their bubbles. Those who are well, they don't need a physician. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. 
A man-centered religion makes you think that you can earn acceptance from God by your own moral standards. It teaches us that we can clean ourselves and present ourselves acceptable to God. We think that if we do the right things and polish ourselves, we can earn Jesus' acceptance. Jesus has earned our our acceptance on our behalf. That is the beauty of the gospel, that the guilty sinners are forgiven, not on the basis of their merit, but on the basis of Christ's merit. Good works do not equate to good standing with God. Self-righteous people and work-based gospel meet a crushing here in this text. And in Jesus' statement, I have come for the needy, not for the the so-called righteous. If you are needy and need to deal with the weight of your sin, Jesus has come to lay down his life for you. Do you recognize that you need forgiveness for sin? He has come for this beautiful exchange. Providing forgiveness for the scandalous sinner. A scandal of grace, saving an undeserving sinner. Charles Spurgeon, in such a beautiful statement, he says that the the first link between Christ and my soul is not my goodness, but my badness. Not my merit, but my misery. Not standing, but my falling. Not my riches, but my poverty. He comes to visit his people, yet not to admire their beauty, but to remove their deformities, not to regard their virtues, but to forgive their sins. God is in the business of rescuing bad people. It is not the good people that go to heaven. It is the bad people who have been rescued by the gospel that get to bask in the eternal glories of Christ. The people who recognize their sickness and their need for a chief physician. Those who stand on their own merit will stand condemned. But because of, our be- not because of our best deeds, we are tainted by sin. And your sin must be paid for. Your own righteousness before a holy God stands like filthy garment and filthy, they are filthy rags. We must not stay in our own little holy huddle as a church and hold hands and sing kumbaya We must take the gospel of Jesus Christ to some of the most difficult places. Are you facing hostility in your workplace? Maybe it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that is able to wet the heart, the hardened hearts of man. We must go to the places where Christ has plucked us out and take the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not to stand in blending with them, but to stand distinct as the ones who have been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel that is able to save. The gospel of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May I invite us to Ephesians chapter 2. May I invite us to Ephesians chapter 2. This is a description of the state where we were, how we were before the grace of God saved us. In his letter to the church in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul writes, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we were all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. With him, in, 
in the coming ages, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. This is the testimony of our saving, of how we have been saved. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are thankful this morning that we could come face to face with this text. A text that has demonstrated to us that you are in the business of saving sinners. How we see a man who because of his trade he has um, built up a whole collection of enemies. He was seen as the scum of the earth because of his trade. The man was described or defined by his trade. But, oh God, you looked beyond his trade. You looked beyond the things that were defining him. You called him to follow you. And because in you calling us, oh God, your call is irresistible, the man responded to the irresistible call of grace. And this man did not just bask in the beauty of forgiveness. This man did not just sit and bask in the joy of salvation, but he called his friends. And Lord, may you cause us that in the way that you have saved us, may we call our friends that they may come and experience the beauty of your saving grace. That, oh God, they may have the testimony that, oh God, you have called them out of the merry clay of sin and you have established their, their feet on a solid ground. Help us, oh God, to be a church that is mindful that we are called to beacon the sinners to repent. Help us to do that, oh God. Where we find ourselves fearful, oh God, may you cause us to be bold. Where our feet are weakened when we think of going into those difficult places. God, may you strengthen us, oh God. Strengthen our feet and strengthen our resolve. Lord, put words in our mouth that we may speak the words of life. For only you, oh God, you have the words of eternal life. We don't want to go out there and speak our own agenda. We don't want to go out there and lie to people with philosophies of man. But, oh God, we want to preach this offending gospel of Jesus Christ. And may we take this gospel with grace to the dying world around us. And call men to repentance. And, Lord, as parents, may you help us to do that for our own little ones. Who have not experienced the gospel. Lord, may we gracefully give this gospel to our children, oh God, for them to understand that they don't have to impress you to be saved, but all they have to do is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall be saved. You will expose to them their need for a savior and you alone can save them. For you are a savior who is able to save to the uttermost. May you do that, O oh God, to the glory of your Son, O oh God, and to the joy of your people. You alone you are able to save. Strengthen us, O oh God. Embold us, O oh God. Give us courage to preach the gospel, the gospel that is able to save. That we may stand like the Apostle Paul, who said in Romans 1:16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For this gospel has the power to save. May we do that, O oh God, to the glory of your name. Bless us, O oh God, this week. Even, Lord, as we rest in this long weekend, may we do that, O oh God. We pray for our nation, O oh God. We have made strides for 57 years, O oh God. We have tasted your goodness. We have experienced peace and tranquility. And God, this is not because we are better than other nations, but because in your grace you chose to spare us. And you sparing us, O oh God, may we be charged to pray for other nations 
who have not tasted this tranquility, O oh God. Bless our president. Bless, O oh God, our cabinet. Bless our parliament. Bless our legislators. Bless even the judiciary, O oh God, that we may continue to experience this common grace that you have extended to our nation. This we pray, O oh God, in the matchless name of our Lord. And Lord, we pray for the ones that have traveled, our friends who have traveled outside uh, the city. Lord, may you bless them, may you keep them, may you protect them, O oh God. May they experience the comforting hand of grace in their business as they go about doing their daily work. This we pray, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Dismiss us, O oh God, with your love. Dismiss us in your care. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.